Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Young Neurosurgeon's uh, second webinar about neurosurgical education. This is a really important topic close to our heart, and we are delighted to have three wonderful speakers with us today. Uh, Dr. Estene cannot join us today, unfortunately, uh, but we have three impressive talks, one from Dr. Martin Steenen and Felix Stengel, uh, Dr. Alexandra Alessandro Perin and Dr. Aaron Cohen. So first of all, um, we'll have the talk from Dr. Martin Steenen and Dr. Felix Stengel about survey on training modalities in European neurosurgery, use of virtual training. Dr. Um, Steenen is a neurosurgeon, attending neurosurgeon in St. Gallen Hospital in Switzerland and Dr. Felix Stengel is training at the same institution. We're very excited to hear your talk. Please take it away, Dr. Stengel. So thank you, Maurice. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for the invitation to this talk and also for the kind words and uh, kind, kind invitation, kind introduction. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a resident in um, the neurosurgical department in St. Gallen, working with uh, Martin Steenen. And our talk today is about the transformation of neurosurgical training. Currently, we're experiencing a change in neurosurgical training due to the fact that there are recently more and more uh, modern training technologies like augmented reality or virtual reality and simulation-based models are increasingly applied in neurosurgery. And these technologies are not only used in planning and performing an operative procedure, they're also used for operative training of trainees and um, also for world certified neurosurgeons. And in former days, one said, see one, do one, teach one. But nowadays, this might be a bit more complicated due to working time restrictions. But still, um, the standard training is the hands-on training in the OR. So one might question, is it safe to perform neurosurgical training in the OR? And there are several studies done in the last um, recent years investigation, investigating the safety of those uh, specific um, operations. For example, here, one of Martin Stein's study um, investigating the safety of education uh, performing an ACDF, another one uh, investigating uh, the micro, uh, microscopic lumbar discectomy, another one focusing on the decompression of spinal stenosis, and there are many more. Uh, shunt implantation is one, or uh, lumbar transforminal epidural steroid injection, and one more, uh, the retrosigmoid approach, and all these studies came to the conclusion that indeed it is safe to perform um, or to do neurosurgical training in the OR. But as I mentioned, we got this problem nowadays that due to occupational health and safety laws, our training time or working time is restricted and this affects our training. So we got this nice survey from uh, 2015 from Martin Steenen uh, with about 500 respondents all over um, Europe um, where the residents were asked about their working time and less than 40% of the residents conform with a 48 hours a week. But interestingly, more than half of the residents would work more than these um, to ensure their training and education or if this neurosurgical training were to improve. So we have the balancing act between the legal regulations on the one hand, and on the other hand, to ensure the neurosurgical training. So how does our conventional training look like? As I mentioned, I think the gold standard um, is the training in the OR, and we also have the cadaver lab training. Um, we can perform uh, and train specific operations in a safe environment without the risk of harming any patient. And on the other hand, we have the modern training technologies, which are increasingly arising and uh, they're more and more um, uh, yeah, 
coming to the market. So we see, for example, on the left side here, some cranial or spinal based simulators, for example, for application of pedicle screws. And here on the right side, we see some virtual or augmented reality technology um, simulating um, these kind of um, operations or procedures. So when we talk about these modern training technologies, um, it's also a question of the uh, clinical utility of these technologies. So they should have a positive influence on the current surgical workflow, um, ultimately on the treatment of the patients in terms of quality, efficiency, and also safety. And this is, might, might be not clear for every of these technologies. So when we talk about these technologies, it's also a question of definition of, of these terms. Um, I find a lot of slightly different definitions of these, um, of these terms. And I think down here, this is, um, I think, the most logic definition. On the one hand, you have the real environment. And on the right side, you have the virtual environment. And most of the um, technologies we talk about, maybe also today, is uh, they are mixed reality. So in the middle, Mr. Bean here with his goggles on, this is a virtual reality. He is you know, totally in a re virtual reality. But on the other hand, for example, here, the neural navigation, this is a good example for augmented reality. You have a virtual object which is projected into your real environment. So um, this lead us, uh, leads us to, to a survey we performed by the ENS Young Neurosurgeons uh, launched uh, in the beginning of uh, 22. And um, with the purpose of um, having an impression of how frequently are those techniques currently used in the training of uh, neurosurgical residents and how do the um, respondents value these techniques. So what is the subjective value to see if there's any possible transformation of how training is done. And we launched this or shared this, um, um, this survey with uh, ENS and also with uh, friends from Flank, also from South America and Latin America. Uh, I don't want to go too deep into those figures of the demographics, just to show you that we got about 500 um, respondents and well distributed between residents and also board certified neurosurgeons um, across the world, especially Europe and Latin America. And our first important question was, have you ever been trained with modern um, technology? Um, interestingly, only one third of the participants had the experience with those kind of technologies. And on the other hand, we asked, have you ever attended any training courses in the past three years um, using modern technology or using the conventional training technologies like cadaver lab training? And here you see the first big difference. Um, more than 70% of the um, participants um, had attended um, cadaver lab hands-on training but on the other hand, less than 40% made the experience with uh, those modern training, training courses. So it might be also some influence um, or some financial influence. So in this box plot, um, we evaluated the relationship between the availability of modern training technologies in each hospital and the GDP per capita for each country. And we used a paired t-test um, to see or reveal a high significant association between a high GDP per capita as a positive predictor to um, the availability of um, modern training technology. So if modern, tra uh, modern training technology was available, the mean GDP per capita was about 43,000 US dollars. So financial resources do play a role in the availability of those training technologies or in the training of residents outside the OR. We also uh, performed this test um, in association 
with the availability of Cadaver Lab training, there was uh, similar um, results. Um, the difference was not that clear, but it was still significant. And coming to the second important point of our survey, that was the subjective evaluation. We scaled the value from zero, not valuable at all, to five, extremely valuable. And respondents um, rated the OR training, um, here's in red on the right-hand side, as the most valuable method. And the second highest rating um, received the Cadaver Lab training um, with a highly significant difference to the training in the OR and also a highly significant difference to all the other modern training technologies. They got still a high rating, but it was um, less than the Cadaver Lab training. So just to summarize our, our results and our um, conclusion, the Cadaver Labs um, is the technology which is far more often used than on any other modern training technologies nowadays still. And the OR training or the hands-on training in the OR is still um, rated as the most valuable um, training um, or more valuable than any other conventional or modern training technology. And this leads us to the conclusion that it remains critical and it's very important to ensure sufficient OR exposure to um, in, in terms of training and neurosurgical training and that our modern training technologies they might complement this defi uh, deficit as I mentioned before we have the restricted working times um, due to our legal restrictions but on the other hand um, it is necessary to get the training in the OR so the modern training technology can complement this but it cannot uh, replace the training in the OR or um, replace the conventional training um, technology. So thank you for your attendance and um, attention and I'm happy to ask uh, to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Senyo. And uh, if there are any questions, please write them down in the Q&A box and not in the chat box, so we can answer that. But I think we can move on to um, the next block. I can just ask you something. What would you be your ideal training mix, so to say? What, what do you think would be an ideal setup like if you would put together a training program that you think, because you're now in training? Yes, um, I think it's a good mixture between training in the OR because it's the real scenario. You cannot simulate this real scenario in a cadaver lab training or simulator lab training. And I would, I think a good mixture between all of them is good. Um, you need the OR training. I think you also, it is good to perform some training um, on the cadaver lab um, for anatomy and for especially pedicle screw placement. Um, and I think the simulator based models, um, they are useful, but they are limited. Um, it is interesting to see, oh, it is interesting to, 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 to use them, but they're very limited, I think, I guess, yeah. I if, if I may comment on this too, what we currently try to build up, and, and we're in the process of this, actually we have already built a couple of modules in St. Gallen is that we have um, like a course where residents, when they join the, the department, they are um, signed up for a adaptive learning. It's like an e-learning where they get a lot of um, theoretical background on a specific surgical technique, let's say lumbar disc surgery, and they have to go through this adaptive learning uh, until they are approved from a theoretical point of view. Then we go to a um, a, a cloud, like a, um, a simulator. We for, for spine, for example, we, we just purchased uh, the real spine model where they can learn how to do a, a lumbar discectomy, where it's like bleeding and you have a, a CSF leak if you're not not careful. Um, and then if they if they do this too, then they are approved to go to the real patient, and actually then they can benefit more from the 
patient-based training, which then is a very long process, of course. <clears throat> I remember I had already operated 50 patients with the lumbar disc, and I thought, wow, now I'm done. I know how to do this. And when I had to operate the 51st patient, I struggled. So it's, it's a very long process. But in order to get a very good start, I think it's good to have simulators and models. That's my personal opinion. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, we can make, move on if there are no... Uh, well, Catherine, yes. yeah, I wanted to ask uh, Felix the same question that Laura mentioned. He was talking about the differences, the, the financial issues that uh, unfortunately make the training of some countries more difficult than in other countries who have a high income, right? And uh, I want to just ask uh, Felix and all the audience, if us as a society should be more more aware of these differences and should make an effort to to balance or to help these countries that maybe don't have the, the access to the simulators and the beautiful things that we are enjoying nowadays for the audience and for all the speakers. Maybe I, for can, Felix. maybe I can say a few words to that uh, because we also tested uh, any any influence of the GDP to the um, attendance of training courses, and there was no um, association between GDP per capita to, um, to um, attendance of those training courses. It was just. It was just. Pardon? Okay, Felix, I, I couldn't hear the rest of what you said, but I'm not uh, sure. Yeah. So the Can GDP was not, was not an influencing factor. It was not a predictor for attending any training courses. It was just a predictor for the availability of those training technologies in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the hospital um, of each country. So we had a question from Dr. Lipa saying, uh, is there a way to overcome financial issues relative to cadaver lab attendance? Because some countries might not have the same resources and others. Well, that's a very, that's very tough question, um, I think. Uh, but I, th I think depending on the country where you practice the the costs involved in organizing courses can differ very much. I mean, they can be very fancy or they can be very basic, but I think at least for cadaver courses, it's possible to, to organize them anywhere. As Felix mentioned, to really uh, purchase new technology like we did with, with you know, our lab that we built up, that involves a lot of, of financial resources. And, and I couldn't answer the question how to, <laughs> Make this available to all to all places, um, but I think as the as there are more on the market, the prices would naturally go down, and then it would be more affordable for for others as well. So I, I see us also as early adopters. I mean, some of the stuff that we do and try and test is not fully developed, and we help them to develop it further, and then I'm very much hoping that the prices will make it affordable to, to other regions as well. Right. And there's also another question here from Dr. Garage um, saying, has there been an evaluation of the value of the use of training on live animals in any surgical training program? He's not certain if this is legal in Europe. Um, I, I just know from the AO, um, where I'm also involved, um, that they have stopped um, working on live animals because of ethical uh, issues. So I don't, I don't even know of any study investigating the value of it. I just know from people that participated in these courses that the, the knowledge gain was actually pretty phenomenal. However, I personally never attended one, so I cannot speak. Uh, I don't have any personal experience. And I also, I love animals, so I'm kind of happy that it doesn't take place anymore. However, from a training perspective, I think it was pretty awesome. But maybe the models can get as good as that, you know, in the near future. Yeah. Okay. 
All right. Uh, is there a comment from Dr. Rafa? No, no, I, I was. I want just to come back uh, a little bit about the financial availability. I agree with Felix that this could be a real limitation in some countries, but uh, uh, this can be particularly true uh, for um, simulation, complex simulation uh, techniques, augmented reality, virtual reality. But there are also uh, other types of simulators like physical models, cranial and uh, spinal physical models that can be also helpful for training just before entering the, uh, the OR. Uh, what do you think about that? What did you found in, in your survey? Is there any correlation with, with, with the growth uh, um, uh, with the GDP? Uh, with the GDP, we just uh, investigated this for all uh, modern training technologies and for the conventional training technologies. There was uh, the question if it's if if there's available uh, availability. Um, in each, in the hospital, it was relevant. Uh, the financial resources were relevant, but not um, uh, in in case of um, training courses. So we thought, yes, it might be due to the high initial costs of those modern training technologies. But once you have them, the um, it is easy to 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 have them in use. It's not very cost effective. Some data that we did not present here, um, but we were surprised to, to, to look at it. Um, we, we, we were sure that there would be a correlation between participants' age and the value of, of modern technologies. Let's say we thought that the young people would be very happy about modern technology and say, wow, virtual reality is cool. And there was not <laughs> such a relationship, which you know we, we might discuss later, maybe after the presentations of the others, but um, I was really surprised because I would have expected that the young people are going through the roof with new technology, but there was no age relationship. Just to mention that already. Wow, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. Thank you so much. So with that, we can move on to the next talk. Next talk, that's from Dr. Uh, Alessandro Perin. Dr. Perrin is an attending neurosurgeon in Milano in Italy, and he's been an attending since 2009 uh, with a clinical fellowship in uh, oncological surgery, neuro-oncology, and um, a PhD in neuro-oncology. Dr. Perrin will talk to us about new training paradigms in neurosurgery, about virtual reality simulations and more. Please, Dr. Perrin. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for this kind invitation. I hope that you can hear me well and uh, see my screen. Uh, so uh, it was very interesting to listen to the previous presentation and also to the Q&A at the end. Um, I, I think it's going to be more interesting to, to discuss this topic after my presentation. So um, I agree, this is a... Uh, uh, hot topic, but at the same time, it's quite uh, controversial. Uh, and I'm not surprised uh, about what Martin just said, the fact that the younger uh, generations are not so into this. Uh, of course, they're more into uh, real surgery. They want to learn the job fast. So this is also my experience. So I, I think this is something that we can discuss later on. So here's my disclosure. So just to limit uh, the topic and the, the, the panorama of my presentation to neurosurgical oncology, uh, the key question here is how do we bring uh, a young medical graduate uh, to the level of being able to do this uh, task efficiently with a good result, with a good outcome? Uh, we can say that this has changed throughout time, so uh, we're not operating like that anymore. We're not relying on these technologies anymore. Uh, we have better imaging, uh, advanced imaging modalities, uh, better ways of visualizing uh, tumors, uh, 
intraoperative, preoperatively. We have intraoperative monitoring, so on and so forth. Uh, the operative microscope is an important aid, navigation, intraoperative MRI, so on and so forth. But the key question is still there uh, on the table. So how do we move from knowing something to being able to do that and to being able to do that at an excellent level? So that's still the question. <clears throat> and we have to bear in mind that our job is particularly difficult because uh, intrinsically, we have a 14% rate of complication, no matter what. So this is something that uh, we can find in the literature. Uh, the question is, how many of those complications are related to the operator's inexperience? So that is an ethical and also medical legal question, considering the fact that that cost is constantly increasing throughout the world, especially for the developing countries. The point is that uh, from a responsibility uh, level, we are doing the job by ourselves. So we are alone from that aspect. We learn the job by observing that we are involved and we have to do something uh, first and for the first time. For the rest of our activity, we are alone from a responsibility level. So we're responsible for what we do. And the key point is that the more we spend time in the OR, uh, the more old we, we get, the better we become. To a certain level, then we decrease because of aging and, and other uh, factors. Uh, but when we mention the fact that we have this curve, we implicitly, we mention the fact that we uh, commit, we do mistakes because of our inexperience. So no surprise that we have the highest rate of uh, medical lawsuit uh, uh, rate. And that goes along with a, a problem. The fact that we want to operate more, especially when we are young. Uh, but what about, this is brilliantly reported in this article, what about kids when we have to operate on children, for instance? And uh, you have to do the case, you're young, you know there's somebody better than you and you're talking with the parents. How do we deal with things like that from an ethical standpoint, not, 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 not to mention the medical uh, legal uh, issue. Uh, I just want to show you a case, something that happened to me while I was a fellow in, in Montreal, and there was this resident uh, operating and doing, uh, taking care of the hemostasis at the end of operation. So a simple, let's say so, uh, high-grade glioma. Uh, look at what happens when uh, that resident comes in. So if you look at the tip of the suction probe, I show you slow motion now. So this is a typical mistake due to uncoordination. So that you have the problem coordinating your hands under the operative microscope. So how do we deal with this mistake? When you know that you are responsible for the case, you as a senior a surgeon, um, but at the same time, you're responsible for training that individual. Uh, so this is the uh, cultural, the, the technological uh, milieu when we created this center in 2016. We call it Best Neurosurgery Center. It's the first uh, European neurosurgery, neurosurgery dedicated uh, training simulation center. And it is endowed with a, a bunch of uh, high technology devices. I don't want to spend time showing you this. I mean, you can find everything on our website. Uh, they are devices created in order for you to improve your uh, bimanual skills uh, and measure the progress of your improvement. So we want to build uh, learning curves for all the, the, the trainees that are, are trained at our center. Uh, we also created an intraoperative ultrasound device that I'll show you later. Uh, we have all the 3D virtual reality haptic feedback uh, simulators that are available on the market. We can discuss that later on, uh, like immersive touch uh, or Vesalius, which is a surgical planner, our uh, 3D rehearsing device. Uh, or uh, we have um, NeuroTouch, NeuroVR, uh, which is probably the best uh, uh, 3D virtual reality haptic feedback simulator 
uh, for neurosurgery. You can do both endoscopic and microscopic uh, procedures like tumor removal, hemostasis, opening of the cilium fissure, and so on and so forth. Uh, plus, we also have a surgical theater, which is a neurosurgery dedicated platform uh, for surgical rehearsal. You can fashion craniotomies, you can clip aneurysms, and I'll show you some studies that we did later on. <laughs> We also created this uh, platform, which is called NeuroStream. It's a free tool, which is available to all neurosurgery residents. And it is mainly dedicated to intraoperative uh, ultrasound. So for those residents or, or neurosurgeons interested in learning fast how to interpret intraoperative ultrasound data and pair that, compare that with uh, real time with preoperative MRI, these website, it transforms your smartphone into a virtual interoperative ultrasound probe. And it's something that you can do at any time uh, in your office or when you are at home. Uh, and it's very practical and easy to use. And it, we prove that just by one application, you can improve your um, ability to uh, decipher, to interpret interoperative ultrasound images. Uh, we also created this uh, uh, phantoms, uh, they are endowed with a, a fake bone, a fake dura, and you can use that combined with navigation, and you can use that feature of intraoperative ultrasound um, live. Um, I'll just show you where we can tackle and, and switch the dura. Uh, we spent a lot, big effort in making it uh, quite realistic. So we created a pia mater, an arachnoid, and this is a model of meningioma. And uh, um, as compared to other models that are available, these are something that we believe are quite realistic and they can mimic uh, a cadaver, uh, as you were discussing uh, early on, Felix. So uh, we all know that cadavers are difficult to, uh, to get. Um, they are expensive. There are some issues in how to dispose them when you are done with your job. Uh, this is something that mimics some of the features also in the interface between tumor and brain. So uh, we are confident that this might be something probably even better received as compared to virtual reality for young residents. So at a glimpse, some of the studies that we conducted here at uh, our center, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but we wanted to measure how useful uh, these platforms like surgical theater uh, are uh, for junior residents in order to learn the surgical anatomy and get involved uh, during the operation. So this platform allows you also to uh, see some augmented reality during surgery. So you can overlap um, the preoperative uh, data, uh, uh, imaging, advanced imaging, even DTI, functional data on your um, on your surgical uh, uh, and integrate that in your microscope. So uh, we conducted some studies like the STARS and we wanted to measure the impact of, of this technology on residents. And we saw that this technology was very well received. It doesn't impact on the length of surgery and the residents, they claim that they can get a better understanding of surgical anatomy and get more involved during surgery. We also declined that in the vascular uh, neurosurgery with the STARS cascade. Um, it's a special feature of this platform. It allows you to uh, plan your surgical operation and design your craniotomy beforehand and decide what is the best clip that you wanna use on a specific kind of aneurysm. So, this is an exemplificative case. So there was this uh, MCA aneurysm. And according to the surgeon that he wants to use a curved clip, according to the simulator, the uh, straight clip uh, seemed to be better. So it's interesting that when it came to real uh, surgery, uh, the first attempt was done with a curved clip. And um, accordingly to the preoperative simulator, uh, the simulation it was not the best choice. So eventually the surgeon uh, decided to go with a straight clip that turned out to be uh, the best choice uh, since it could exclude completely the aneurysm without impacting on any 
collateral uh, arterial branches. Uh, it's proof also with this video. Uh, there was another uh, stars that we conducted dedicated for uh, skull-based uh, surgery. And again, uh, the feedback was extremely positive. So the residents, they got a better understanding of uh, neurosurgical anatomy and they felt more involved during surgery because they could discuss the case preoperatively with the surgeon and postoperatively during a debriefing session. We also uh, wanted to use uh, this technology uh, while acquiring the informed consent. And as you know, it's uh, always a debated topic. So you never know whether you are overwhelming the patient with too many unnecessary information or you are too uh, concise. So that is something that we were spending uh, a lot of time uh, at our center and energy. So we decided to conduct this study. We call it SPLICE. And basically it was uh, a study when we divided our patient prospectively into three arms. So control and two high technology informed consent arms. Basically the idea was to discuss the case first traditionally and then go for a second round of <clears throat> virtual reality uh, visualization of the tumor. So the patient himself in this case uh, was asked to wear like in this case 3D glasses and he was entering his own head and see his own tumor. So uh, in a way he was exposed to uh, a lot of information. And it was interesting to see that uh, when you ask the patient, so in the control, in the experimental arms, after this round of consultations, all of them, they claimed that they understood everything. So all the benefits and risk of the operation, they think that they understood everything. But when you go to a uh, organized questionnaire of, and you go systemic, systematically, uh, you see that uh, there's a objective, uh, better comprehension when you are in the experimental arm as compared to control. Uh, and that is even more striking when it comes to the comprehension of the risks uh, that the patient is exposed during surgery. Interestingly, anxiety doesn't change. We were worried that probably this overexposure would have impacted on anxiety. That is not the case. Uh, we also wanted to measure whether um, uh, another uh, platform like uh, uh, Immersive Touch was useful for EVD placement, and it turned out to be like that. We, we published that. Uh, but the key question was, where did you expose young resident to simulation or control? Do you see, can you measure an improvement in the way they resect the tumor? And this is something that we are about to publish, so it's not published yet, but the result was striking just with a three day exposure of high intensity simulation. So uh, when you measure that uh, on this model of tumor and you measure that in a blinded fashion uh, and you uh, use multiple uh, evaluators, the result is like that. So uh, virtual simulation can uh, actually improve your surgical, microsurgical skills. We, have, we also run ma many, many courses together with DANS or with other societies. I don't wanna spend too much time on that. There's a course which is called ABC, uh, run together with Carlos Schaller in Geneva. And the response from the participants was extremely positive. We published this on, uh, in this publication. Now we are uh, involved with this uh, European uh, funded project, which is called INAID, and Marike is one of the partners, and uh, I'm glad that she's here. Uh, next week, we, we'll have the first get together with the first course uh, with all the participants from all over Europe. The idea is to combine simulation and the best training possible that you can get at uh, at the, the best neurosurgery centers across Europe. So uh, just to recapitulate or parallel the same journey that Aeneas did uh, many, many years ago. And the concept is that we would like to uh, create a new generation of neurosurgeons uh, of the future, starting with PGY1, uh, that are uh, trained with a driving license to neurosurgery that is uh, relying only on uh, cadavers and simulation. Then they spend some time at their home departments. And um, in the middle of this course, they're gonna do this early uh, fellowship 
uh, early fellowship course, two months fellowship at, at every of these of these centers across Europe. Then they go back and we want to measure the progress of these residents in a, a scientific standardized fashion. And simulators, they allow you to do that because you can measure uh, how much they improve in a, a standardized fashion. Um, these are the rotation centers uh, where they will go. And these are the pillars. So cadaver lab, uh, 3D virtual reality simulation, plus something that is sometimes neglect, uh, which is communication and empathy training. So we have some dedicated sessions where we would like to at least expose junior residents to this, which is a problem. So communication between doctors and doctors and doctors and patients. There are some features like online syllabus, so a standardized ways of measuring what are the things that they need to learn and an online log, something that we can control as tutors. So what is the progress for each one of these uh, residents? And the idea would be to standardize and bring the European uh, level of training in neurosurgery to a higher degree. And that's why we have the EANS as a partner. Um, this is uh, all that I wanted to share with you. I don't know if there's any questions or comments. I would be glad to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Farin. That was highly, that was really impressive. I really enjoyed that talk. And there were a lot of interesting things there uh, that you shared with us. Thank you. So I was wondering, is there is the model that you have where you can train on the tissue, is that commercialized or? No, Not yet. Uh, it is something that we are uh, still developing because, as I said, uh, we are implementing something like fluorescence and uh, uh, navigation and uh, interoperative ultrasound, these features. Uh, I don't know whether it's going to be commercialized or only available here during our courses or together with EANS. Um, so far, it's a, a non-profit. Uh, Thing that we develop. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. So uh, there's, there's a question from Dr. Brookman. Well, first of all, thank you so much for this inspiring talk. And wow, you've worked so hard to develop all these models. Um, you touched upon a couple of very interesting things, and I have actually two questions for you. So you touched upon the learning curve and how that raises uh, legal challenges ethical challenges but if we don't train residents well in the future we don't have uh, surgeons so that's also unethical my first question is if you were to describe the ideal learning trajectory uh, that imposes as few risks as possible to the patients but trains doctors as good as possible how would you do that and my second question would be the role of the non-technical skills. You touched upon that in our uh, project uh, by describing the, your our project, but how do these fit in? Because I think there is a difference between practicing on a super nice advanced model and operating on a patient. You get more nervous. You're more aware of the complexity of, of human life and the implications of your actions. Um, is there a way we can include that in the training? So that relates a little bit to the first question as well. I'm very curious to hear your opinion and thank you again for the talk. Marika, these are very, very tough questions. So uh, I'm not sure I will be able to, to answer those, but I'll try. So first uh, question, um, I think that we are fine the way we are. I mean, uh, this is an acceptable way of training residents, right? So. Uh, books first, then uh, cadavers, then you know courses, EANS, then you follow your your mentor and you watch I don't know uh, 100 operations. Then it comes one day when you are more involved. So we manage right to do that. Uh, if you ask me, is there a better way? Uh, probably yes. And technology, as uh, Felix and and Martin said, uh, it, it's an aid. It's something that we can take advantage of. Uh, I don't know whether we will all be replaced uh, by algorithms and uh, robots in the future. So this is another thing that we have to keep you know, in the room. 
it's the elephant in the room for some specialties that already happen or is about to happen. So I'm confident that probably surgery and neurosurgery in particular will be something that will be replaced uh, later on, at, at a later stage maybe. But um, I, I, there's no perfect uh, recipe uh, so far. And I think that the project that we are doing together uh, maybe, maybe will help us in finding something more uh, if there's a more intelligent way of doing that. Uh, going to the second question, then back to the first question later. <clears throat> um, well, um, it, is, uh, it is difficult to, to, to answer that. Um, soft skills, can we train them? I don't know. Or is it something that is part of the way we are as human beings? Uh, and then, you know, uh, either you have them or not. Uh, I believe that you can bring everybody to a certain level of a level of decency, which is better than nothing. But I believe that is something that you should be uh, trained during the first uh, probably five years of your life or 10 years, right? So the way we are treated as a child. So there's plenty of papers and publications on that. So I'm not adding anything new about that. Uh, but I think it's worth mentioning uh, that problem. And I think it's something that we should spend more uh, attention as uh, senior uh, neurosurgeons with younger colleagues. Um, going back to the thing that uh, the idea training is on patients, I agree with you. I mean, that kind of training is something uh, impossible to be replaced. But at the same time, I'm asking you, do you think you are a better surgeon today as compared to the way you were five years ago? I think that we will all agree that we are better surgeons today. That implies that the surgeries you did five years ago, they were suboptimal, right? I, I mean, it's part of the game, it, it's there. We all know that, that's why uh, sometimes patients, they want a, a, an old neurosurgeon, and I understand that. But at the same time, it, it, you pointed that at the beginning of your uh, question time, uh, we have to train young neurosurgeons. When we say that, it implies that some patients will get a suboptimal operation in order to, you know, trespass through to, pass over that information and, and uh, knowledge. So um, there are ethical and medical legal issues and uh, I don't have a perfect uh, uh, solution for that. Uh, I wonder about the other presenters. Thank you so much. There is a question from Dr. Rafa. It's not a question, it's a comment. Uh, I just want to congratulate with Alessandro. He has been a real pioneer in simulation uh, in neurosurgery in Italy and probably also in Europe. So congratulations, Alessandro. Uh, you have a, a wonderful uh, uh, simulation center with a concentration of uh, uh, a lot of technologies very expensive technologies. And my comment was about the, uh, the role that this kind of uh, centers can have in the education of uh, um, neurosurgical residents uh, all uh, around Europe. I've seen your uh, um, innate program, I like it very much. And uh, I would like to ask you if you uh, um, want to further expand the, this program involving uh, a higher number of neurosurgical centers in Europe and for also a higher number of uh, neurosurgical residents just to share the, oppor the unique opportunity to use these technologies. Well, thank you for your words. Um, I, uh, just for the sake of time, um, going to the NAID project, it's, uh, it's a study. So we don't know whether that is effective or not. So we have to validate this paradigm uh, together with Marike and the other partners, we will find what is more effective, what is not effective, what is something that can be done better. And hopefully we can provide the neurosurgical community with some better tools to train uh, residents. Uh, the ideal is that probably in that uh, uh, 
compendium of, of the tools, there might be something useful. And this is also the belief of the EANS, which is supporting us. Um, we will see in, in two years or three years from now, we will know more and, and I'll get back to, to all of you. Thank you so much. There was also um, another question from Dr. Nikolai Tonchev here uh, that I also was reflecting upon. When you showed that map, that looked super impressive. I really like that. In Australia, when you join a training program, you have to go to a center where you were assigned and you, you go like every six months. So that's part of the deal. You could just be sent to New Zealand just as well. And that gives you a broad, you know, um, exposes you to a broad variety of different surgeons. But the question here is, do you think that we should work harder in that direction uh, to make observerships rotations uh, easier within Europe? Because it's still very difficult to get to do a rotation um, in another country. You know, your, your home department sort of wants to hold on to you to do on calls, that sort of thing, uh, or hospital bureaucracy, that sort of thing. So that's the question. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I could spend one hour uh, talking about all the difficulties that we have faced and that we are still facing in order to allow residents to practice or to observe in the OR uh, across Europe. So this is one of the main problems that we have in Europe. And I think that we need to um, overcome this. And I hope that this project, the NAID, will provide a platform, a way to make this training more standardized because the way I, I see it is that we have uh, USA as our counterpart uh, and we should uh, compete at that level. Uh, I don't think that we should still uh, think like separated countries, uh, at least for, uh, for our specialty. But I, I understand that it is not easy from, from many, many, many aspects. Thank you so much. We're going to move on to the next talk, which is going to be from Dr. Aaron Cohen. Dr. Cohen, we are honored that you're with us. Dr. Cohen is CEO and founder of uh, Neurosurgical Atlas, and he has he's been director of neuro-oncology in Indiana University Department of Neurosurgery. And we are honored to have you with us. Neurosurgical Atlas reflects Dr. Cohen's experience of 5,500 complex cases in neurosurgery. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here today. Um, I want to thank uh, all the committee members who have uh, allowed me to have an opportunity to discuss and thank all the support of our international colleagues for the Neurosurgical Atlas. It's been immense. The Atlas currently has over 65,000 members, by far the largest neurosurgical association in the world. And I'm very indebted to the young neurosurgeons internationally who have been such strong supporters of our work. And obviously we are here for them. So today I wanted to talk about what I think would be the future of neurosurgical operative planning at the same time education. I think um, as Alessandro mentioned that we're not gonna have robots or you know, similar devices take over our job. And I completely agree with him. But we do have to accept that the robots are going to have an important role to support the surgeon. I don't think any idea that robots would take over the surgeon's job is even possible. And not at least in my lifetime or your lifetime. But I do believe that the robots will make your job a lot easier for you to make better decisions. Because as neurosurgeons within surgery, we get sort of very emotionally involved because it's a complicated case. You want to prove yourself. Practicing neurosurgery is stressful. And the moment you get stressed, your processing power, like a computer, gets diminished. And therefore, you have operating blind spots, decision blind spots, without even you knowing it. And that's unintended expanded blind spots is something that I think artificial intelligence robotics can help you. But again, if they're not making your decision, they're not replacing you, but you're your surgical assistant. And I think that would be the role that I want to talk to you about today. I also want to talk about the fact that VR and AR are extremely powerful. 
and for sure will have a role in education, but I don't believe they will have a role in the immediate future. I just think the bigger role would be via artificial intelligence. So if you tell me what is the next big thing, I would say it's AI. I wouldn't say it's VR or AR, not in the operating room, not that it doesn't help with education uh, per se, but I would say that in the operating room, the bigger role will be via AI and the uh, support that it can provide for the surgeon. So we have, as you know, the Neurosurgical Atlas has a sort of a brother and sisters. One of them is the Atlas platform, which will be um, uh, making it available for everyone within the next couple of months. And I want to discuss that with you today. By the way, I have a conflict of interest. None of that relates to the content that I'm going to talk about today. So as we discussed and others mentioned, we started with open surgery, we went to microsurgery, we went to exoscope, we went to endoscope, a lot of technology coming in, but are we doing better? I think that's a big question. Just using another tool, does that make us a better surgeon? And I would argue that it may not. I think the microscope was a big step forward, but making sort of the exoscope or endoscope per se, making us a better surgeon is I think somewhat questionable, although the endoscope obviously was revolutionary in terms of endoscopic skull based surgery, but not necessarily open. So if you talk about open microsurgery, have we transformed ourselves since the time of microsurgery over what, 50, 45 years ago? I would say not. And so how do we go to the next level? in terms of providing the next big thing in the operating room. So that today I wanna to show you the platform that we've been working on. This is one of the first times we're presenting this and I think you'll really enjoy looking at it. And I think we wanna show how you can use artificial intelligence and other 3D technologies, which can easily be translated to AI and VR because the moment the object is in 3D, it can be translated relatively in an easy fashion. So this is Atlas platform. It's a decision-making process and support. So at any point you can put tumor anywhere in the brain and it would give you the approach and their tracks that you could be crossing. See, that's the um, corticospinal tracks that it gives you a warning. And this is a cloud-based software functionality that um, does almost over 600 decision points every second for you, which is not possible on a regular computer, even in the hospital or your advanced computer at home. So the ability for you to, and this can be adjusted to a patient specific model, which would be the big request I'm sure you all are thinking. And as you can see, the ability to move anywhere and get three approaches to any structure in the brain is extremely attractive. And what this does is that the night before your operation, you can essentially go there, draw the tumor. And as you can see here, we have different size tumors. If it's general tumor, ependymoma, glioma, meningioma, you can make the size or scale different as you can see here. And based on that, it will give you three approaches to that tumor. So it's a big confidence builder for the young neurosurgeons. You wanna say, okay, how can I, confirm that the approach that I'm using is effective. And I think this is a software that can do that for you. So after you do that, you can come here and enter the 3D space using exactly the same sort of um, um, space that we were about in 3D to see the route to the tumor. So there is three recommended approach to this tumor right here, as you can see, and you can remove the tumor as you wish and also adjust, it would give you the standard operative anatomy, but adjust it to the patient if you have the MRI. And then you can take arteries, veins, left and right brain out, and then look at your approach to this structure. And I'm gonna go here, and this time the tumor is in the depth. I'm gonna bring it up a little bit just for you to see. And then let's say it's in the trigone of the lateral ventricle or in this area. So it gives you the approach. You can do contralateral and termospheric. 
you can do ipsilateral interhemispheric or a little bit more posterior approach. So you see all these approaches, but not only gives you approach, it also gives you a surgical route. Because remember, you can't go through normal brain through the cone. You have to interhemispherically dissect to go to the tumor. So I'm gonna take out all the cones and you see how it's guiding you through the interhemispheric corridor. It tells you when you enter the brain to get to this tumor. And that can be obviously adjusted on the fly as you need it to be able to remove your tumor. Then will you say that, okay, this is the approach I'm gonna use. And that's a contralateral approach that we have decided to use for a lateral midline tumor. Then you can even go adjust your route that um, you can do here if you want to go medial, if you want to enter the tumor a little bit more sort of in this direction rather than or in this direction, you can adjust the path to the tumor. After you in adjust the path, essentially the microscope within the operating room using its robotics can follow the path of the tumor for you and give you your dynamic navigation through your eyepiece. So at every moment through the brain of the patient, you can see how you're on the path to the tumor or not. You no longer have to sort of look away through the navigation and we always do. So that's the application interoperatively. Then what you can do oh, is- uh, I'm really sorry to interrupt you. If you uh, share that in full mode, then we can enjoy the images a little bit better. Okay, thank you for asking. Is that better? That's fantastic, thank you. Sorry about that, I uh, thank you for letting me know. So this will give you the approach to this tumor, as you can see, three different routes, very similar. And then you say, okay, this is what I've decided, contralateral and immersive approach, let's go to the operating room. When we go to the operating room, we're gonna overlap with some of the other work of our colleagues here today. And as you will see, we have simulated the war environment and the setup in this case. And as you can see here, we have a 3D model of the brain. We have the OR setup. We have the surgeon. We have everybody there with the location of everybody and how the patient should be positioned. In this case, I like the lateral position for brain retraction. And then in fact, even believe it or not, it brings your navigation on your microscope. So you're in 3D space, you can see what your plan was. You can adjust the craniotomy as you wish. You can have different views. And essentially on the operating room table, you can take out and help me here for some reason. Um, let me bring that up to show you here. Let me go in here. And then I can take out the skin. I can take off the skull per se. Where is my skull here? Um, for some reason I have to left and right cerebellum. And for some reason I, and within this skull anatomy, let me see if I can, here we go. You can see the tumor and the route on the position of the table and the position you're planning to do. Essentially, you can see how you're gonna to go to the tumor and remove it. And if this is the route you wanna choose, and then you can even remove the deep structures and look if this is a pathway that is doable for you. So this allows you essentially simulate the OR environment and be able to appreciate if this is the pathway that works for you. We're adding microscope robotics, for you to be able to see essentially along the path of the surgery. So really exciting in my opinion, to be able to almost simulate your pathway the night before the operation. The, this is cloud-based again at the GPU power you need is way, way, way above even a very advanced desktop. But through a cloud system, as you can see, even on your phone, your very old iPhone, you can enjoy this experience. So this is what I really wanted to talk to you about today. It's a huge opportunity for us. Obviously, uh, young neurosurgeons such as you are going to be those who we will look and reach out, look out to or reach out to, to get feedback how this can be improved. But um, 
we are very um, 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 uh, optimistic that this could be a great tool in the armamentarium of a neurosurgeon. And by the way, every time you choose a surgical approach, all the contents of Neurosurgical Atlas will be available to you uh, within the same platform. So I wanna thank you again for an honor to be here and uh, sincerely thank everyone for the attention you have given to the Neurosurgical Atlas. God bless you. Thank you so much for beautiful talk. Very impressive. Thank you. And I, I, how long has this existed? How long have you? Yeah, that's a good question. This has been a project over six years of six people full time wow. and has been sort of a, um, a, a labor of love for me. We didn't want to present it. This is, in fact, your meeting is the second one that we have presented this platform. And that's the amount of respect we have for your organization. But yeah, it's been going on for six years. Thousands of hours of work has been put to it for many people, but we're very excited. Looks fantastic. Thank you, dear. Looks fantastic. And I, I, I was just like sitting there looking at it in awe. I was thinking, oh, wow, this should have been available when I was training. I got all those things, all those cases in OR where uh, you know, you, you have a navigation, but you can't really, the trajectory is wrong, you know, the position is yes. not perfect, all those things that you can, you know, work out in advance. That's such an advantage. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. You're welcome. Yeah. You're, uh, thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Steenan has a yes, question. I, thank you. Well, I wanted to congratulate you to your presentation and, and also your, your achievement with the Neurosurgical Atlas. I don't know any neurosurgeon who has not used it. So thank you. It's really um, something that you contributed to our um, societies and that is very valuable. Um, for this particular presentation, I have a question. So as I understand, this is like one model brain. So it's not individual Correct. imaging that you can put in because naturally, the, I mean, the gross anatomy is always the same, but there are some like arteries and veins, especially for interhemispheric that you could interfere with. <laughs> right. right. So the patient's brain gets warped to this. Okay. So if you have a brain MRI and a CT angiogram, we warp the patient's brain to this. So all the anatomy will the patient's brain, not okay. this. So if you think about it, this is the mecca of AI. And this model, it's called the Atlas Brain, is where all the artificial intelligence information is stored. Individual patients' brain get warped and transformed. They enter this space and they're adjusted, they're registered. Right. And then all that information will be available to you. I mean, I think it's fantastic to, to have a tool like this where you can actually play with anatomy. Let's, let's say, I mean, this yeah. is what it is basically. But I always say operating is like baking a cake, right? You need uh, yes. ingredients and you need a recipe. And, and you know, your ingredients are your, your operative tools and, and you have to think, what do I need in order to achieve the goal of the surgery? And then uh, the, the recipe is the steps of, of the, the case. And this is really based on anatomy. So I think here, this tool gives you a very nice opportunity to go through the recipe and see, does that make sense? Or where will I struggle? Um, or where's the backup plan, right? Um, so congratulations again. I think that it was a very beautiful talk. Martin, thanks. I have a lot of respect for all of you guys and the work you have done in a similar space. So thank you for a very, very kind comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Cohen. And You're with that, we can move on to the round table and questions from the participants. Um, in the round table, we have Dr. Brookman, from attending neurosurgeon in uh, Leiden and Hague University Hospital. We have Dr. Alia, neurosurgeon in uh, University of Iliu in Romania. Maybe I said that wrong, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Dr. Thomas Biriv, uh, attending neurosurgeon in Sofia and Dr. Giovanni Rafa um, in, from Messina, Italy who is a neurosurgeon and re researcher there and a member of um, Young Neurosurgeons Committee, along with Dr. Alvia and Dr. Spirit. So um, any questions? I just wanna ask you all, why do you think 
that comment, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, Martin, that uh, there was no age difference in terms of like, when are people interested in new technology? And younger people are not necessarily into the newest things. Why is that, you think? Um, well, I, I thought about it a lot. Um, I'm, I'm actually not 100% not sure. Um, but I think, I don't want to be mean, but surgical education involves a lot of time. And um, now that I'm not a resident anymore, but I'm training a lot of residents, I realize this even more than when I was a resident. And, and sometimes I think we could do a better job training our residents if we were willing to spend that time. And, and this is also something I was going to, to discuss with Alessandro, by the way, very beautiful presentation. Um, but, you know, I think sometimes simulators could be an excuse. I, I, will, I will be provocative here. Could be an excuse for the older generation not to dedicate so much time for training because then you can say, oh, hey, they can train with the machine. I mean, that's great. <laughs> they can learn everything there. And then I can go in my office and write my emails and do my stuff. And, and you know, I, I'm really provocative here. This is not 100% my opinion. But um, this could be one of the reasons why there was not an age um, uh, relationship. Because I think the old people are very enthusiastic about it. They say, hey, great, we have surgical simulators. The, the young people can go and play with it. And the young people are actually not that enthusiastic about it because as Alessandro said correctly, you know, they want to get to the case immediately. If that's good or bad, we can discuss, but um, that could be one of the reasons. Or you could see uh, it the other way around, that we're <laughs> kind of similar in a way. Um, it doesn't depend on our age. It, perhaps it's more our profession. We work every day with technology. And we love new technology. We're all super happy if there's a new phone. And we have this idea that a new phone is always better than the old phone. And I think this optimism regarding innovations, new technology is, is so somewhat spread equally among all age groups. So the more positive explanation could be that it has to do more with the type of people that choose this profession and not so much with uh, the age of the people. <laughs> uh, uh. Yeah, if, if I may comment on that, I, I think that uh, residents probably, uh, when they think of uh, high technology simulation, um, they may have the perception of uh, being part uh, outside of the OR. So, and, and so they, lose time that they are not spending in the OR doing that. So that's my explanation for that. And what I can say is that um, maybe in the future, uh, technology may be uh, an aid and may save us some time uh, from a training perspective. But at this stage, I can tell you that uh, I spend a lot of time uh, with simulators and uh, trainees and so to me it's not a way of saving time actually it's the other way around but um, I, I my explanation is that junior uh, people especially uh, junior residents uh, they don't like that idea or they are not so into that because they think that that is a way to keep them outside of you are so they are pushing us to, to bring them in and to be more involved. That's my perception, but I might be wrong. I don't know. They say that technology is the ultimate surgical addiction. So everybody's addicted for more technology. It doesn't matter if it helps or not. You just want to have it, you know? That's absolutely true. Any other questions or comments? 
Well, I think in at the beginning of this uh, webinar, we briefly touched upon the costs of all this stimulation, uh, stimulators, etc. There, uh, therefore, I'm so excited to see uh, um, Aaron here presenting uh, about the new platform. Uh, very excited that he created Neurosurgical Atlas because it allows people from all over the world to see surgeries that they would otherwise not be exposed to. I think um, I'm very curious how we also as EANS can contribute to global education. How can we make the stimulators more uh, accessible also uh, in countries where there are not the finances to buy the newest stimulator or um, and where you don't want, yeah, ideally you don't want to practice your, uh, on the patient first, but uh, perhaps uh, uh, with the stimulator or something. I'm very curious to hear all your thoughts about this. Well, I mean, oh. if I may comment on this, um, I mean, I, I was very excited to hear Alessandro's presentation and, and I have been following his, you know, systematic um, um, increase of, of, of the use of simulators for the last years. I mean, this has been a very systematic approach and now they're evaluating this. I mean, maybe not every center has to buy these technologies because no, even the, the Swiss centers and people say <laughs> Swiss centers have a lot of money, which, which may be true, maybe not, but we cannot buy all of those. This is impossible, but we could send our people, you know, to Milan and the other centers to train there. And then I think the ENS could um, get involved in terms of kind of helping to fund this, right? Because you don't have to establish simulating sites everywhere in the world, but you can bring the people to the sites that already have a very decent structure. However, when I saw the map and, you know, the surgical sites of excellence and traveling to all these, I thought, wow, I mean, that doesn't seem to be very cheap, you know, to, to do this kind of fellowship here and there and UK and a couple of times Germany. And maybe, maybe you can comment on that. Is that possible to, to pay for? Um, I agree with you. So uh, this kind of uh, high technology content uh, education or training centers, they should be few and uh, people should be sent over to be trained there. So I agree with you. Costs are uh, unbearable and you have to centralize them. Um, thinking about the early fellowship uh, paradigm, which is one of the pillars of this project, uh, it's still a, a guess. Uh, we don't know whether that is really effective or not, but the idea is of being exposed to a, a super specialized uh, training from the very beginning and see what is the impact and the, the, the outcome uh, of that on, on, on that uh, participant. Uh, it is costed. So far, that is covered by the European Commission, uh, which is funding the project. Um, the way I see it is that uh, if you are, we are part of the same uh, community uh, within Europe uh, and we might rely on a, uh, let's say, an accommodation, which is not a five-star accommodation, uh, it shouldn't be that costly, actually. Uh, like you, you might sleep, you know, at the hospital or nearby for one or two months and uh, then you should pay for your living. But... Uh, it shouldn't be that costly, I believe, in Europe at least. With cheap flights, you know, uh, Ryanair and, and, and similar companies, or train. I don't know. I, I, I wonder what is your idea about that. So, yeah, I agree with you that you should move the trainees and not the centers and not in increase the number of centers. But I was also hoping, could we think of developing like stimulators that people can do from home as long as they have like a cell phone or internet or something like that? Isn't there a way we can help education also uh, in those countries where, well, we don't have cheap flights and you can't afford to spend two months in a, in a country where the cost of living are uh, a lot higher. So I was curious to hear thoughts about that. 
well, we developed that platform, Neurostream.academy, and we focus on interoperative uh, ultrasound, which is a cheap technology that might be uh, employed also in uh, across developing countries. And the idea is, as you said, to transform your uh, smartphone uh, into a, a virtual interoperative probe and take advantage of our experience of all the cases that we have done and all the uh, 3D images that we have acquired uh, interoperatively. So that is a way uh, it can be uh, enlarged for sure and, uh, and made better uh, from, many, from many points of view. Um, also that the models that we're working on uh, possibly, they, they shouldn't be too expensive. I mean, even thinking of a possible uh, commercially available product, uh, they are made with a 3D printer. Uh, so that might be another way to, to overcome that. Although those uh, specimens, they are uh, single use, or maybe you know you can use them for two or three surgeries, not, not, no more than that. They are like cadavers, uh, but still might be a way to, to practice and get some experience. And that indeed, the, your app with the ultrasound, yeah, things like that, I think are super valuable for education uh, uh, to uh, increase uh, exposure and uh, yeah super good that you have developed this and uh, yeah thank you and indeed the 3d printers hey, alexandro uh, i will say that you you have shown a, a wonderful case of the dissection of the meningioma so a physical model uh, in my experience, I've seen in different courses that uh, especially junior residents are really enthusiastic to put their hands in these physical models. Uh, probably uh, uh, they are more enthusiastic using this kind of models than using the complex uh, virtual reality or augmented reality uh, uh, techniques because they want, especially if they are junior residents, they want to do something. And trying to dissecting a many drama is a great occasion for them. And from this point of view, I think that physical model probably, uh, especially because they are less expensive, can be used also uh, uh, in uh, in the from the point of view of a global education, also in uh, uh, low and uh, uh, middle income countries. So that could be a good idea for starting sharing new model for education, just using ju these wonderful uh, physical models. I agree with you. And what we are doing now is exactly what you said. So we would like to train people on the physical models and um, measure their progress on simulators. Uh, and uh, eventually in a blinded uh, fashion, we are in, 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 the, in, the, in the theater. Uh, so uh, I agree with you, uh, junior and, and senior residents, they are very keen on operating on, on, on these models. Uh, yeah, the feedback we got is extremely positive. We have a question from one of the participants saying, um, does technology uh, replace real knowledge or real life experiences? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. That's, uh, well, I mean, I think we, we stated clearly, right? Yeah. Time, so I don't know. Comment from Dr. Spe Thomas Spirit. Yes, thank you. Um, so I was very impressed by the by the all the presentations. I have a question about so for Dr. Perrin. Do you think uh, that three D printing might be um, uh, a good a good way to to, to have these simulators in the, in the developing countries? Sorry, you said three D printing. Three D printing is a good yeah. yeah individualized three D printed models for for. Simulation because three D printing is not that expensive nowadays, um, in difference to, to to all these virtual reality models that that we present, which are beautiful but only possible in the dedicated centers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, three D printing is what we are investing on right now. Uh, the key feature is the interface between tumor and brain that is a, a very complex uh, issue but I agree with you that is something uh, cheap and something that can be uh, custom made so we start from the DICOM data from the patient and we actually obtain 
a model that uh, is 100%, uh, uh, it's identical as compared to the, to the patient, yeah. Dr. Steenen has a question as well. Well, it, it's a comment uh, on, on what Marike said earlier, because we were thinking about how to, you know, get maybe simple models to, you know, places that cannot afford the, the high fidelity VR simulators. And uh, what we also have in our hospital is a, a training lab where the residents can go and, and really start to work on some very low fidelity simulators, you know, where you just have some some um, some kind of texture where you can dissect um, tissues from each other and and you know it, it may be a very boring exercise but it gives you the manual dexterity in order to 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 acquire uh, to to do this step of the surgery and you know then the, the whole procedure is many different steps but if you already have the dexterity to do this one thing and then you add another uh, tool uh, where you practice another exercise. I mean, each one of those simulators taken for itself is, is, is kind of boring and, and you feel kind of stupid doing that. However, your, your, your manual skills improve and then you, you might be better in the OR performing. And, and these are actually very cheap. What I could think of is, um, I don't know if you have any personal experience or maybe people that are on the call listening right now, I mean, if we have like a list of, of very good uh, low fidelity simulators that you could just buy in every kind of shop and, and you know, work on this during, you know, quiet hours on, on night call or something, maybe we could propose something like this from the ENS Young Neurosurgeons Group, because that could be some help for global neurosurgery. I mean, not everyone has to buy a VR simulator or can. I remember because we also mentioned 3D printing in our hospital, we had a 3D printed skull and then we just uh, boiled eggs like chicken eggs and put them in the cellar. And then we had to use an endoscope that was an old one from the OR. And then we had to go and, and take the egg shell down and then take out the yellow of the egg, but leave the white intact. And that was a very cool task. And you could rinse and you could use some, some tools and you know, that costs like 60 cents if it's like a chicken that can run uh, on the green. Otherwise it's even cheaper. So if you once build this with a 3D print, you can practice endoscopic transphenoidal, you know, and that doesn't cost anything. Things like that. The same, the same can be done with, with spine surgery, for example, placing screws in, in 3D printed models. So it's, it's a very cheap one. Or like, you know, you can buy like a, a heart from a, a, an ox, uh, you know, the, the butcher will give it to you for free and then you can do uh, micro sutures or bypasses and things like, it doesn't have to be expensive, but you have to train to get good for the OR. Thank this you so much. Yes, I, Dr. I will say, no, this is the sense of education in your surgeon, uh, starting from junior residents, trying to increase manual dexterity, even using simple tasks, very simple tasks. Then you can go to a little bit more complex physical models and where you can learn renal anatomy, you can uh, simulate some procedures and then probably at the last step of the uh, residency program, the, the, the software of Dr. Kengadol will, do, will be perfect to plan your surgery, to uh, revise your case before entering the OR, uh, 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 I think this could be a good path for our neurosurgery residency. There is a question from one of the participants. Um, is there a difference in preference for simulators between US and Europe? US residents get 88 hours per week and Europeans get 48 hours. I wonder if this affects training preferences. Maybe Dr. Cohen can answer that. You know, to be honest with you, this comes down to a very similar idea that I personally feel differently maybe than others. 
uh, people say, okay, I've done 800 AVMs. You have done 600 AVMs, Aaron. I'm better than you. They don't say that in your face, but they sort of try to make you conclude that. I don't know if that's true. There is a certain le le number you have to do that is important. You can't say, well, I've done five, you have done 600, so I'm as good as you are. I think that's a different um, issue. I don't believe that would hold. But if you have done 150, 200 AVMs, I think you're a master surgeon AVM. If you have done 800 versus 200, I don't know if that makes a difference. I have actually seen people that have done 800 AVMs and they're a much worse AVM surgeon than the one who have done 200 because they have just repeated the same mistake 800 times versus the surgeon who did 200 times but was very methodical and careful and learned a lot more and is a much better surgeon. So the number of procedures per se, I don't know if that's important. There's a minimal number. After that, the exponential increase in experience is really related to the learner. So I would say 48 versus 80, I think at least 20 or 30 is important. Would you do 40 or 80? I just don't know if that's a big difference, to be honest with you. That's great. Thank you so much. That's sure. absolutely true. Um, there is a question for you, Dr. Cohen, actually coming to my phone. <laughs> it's a bit of a controversial form of asking questions through WhatsApp from Dr. Freschlag um, saying that there are platforms introducing a structured way of editing surgical videos and offer peer review of personal cases. Do you use the videos you provide in the Atlas in any part of your residence training? Uh, the last part, I'm sorry, again, what about residence training? Did any of what my videos, could you repeat that? So I, I was trying also to, to catch on the question, but uh, he says that there are platforms introducing structured sure. way of editing surgical videos and offer peer review of personal cases. And uh, Dr. Freyschlag mentions my Sebastian. Um, do you use the videos that you provide in the Atlas in any part of your residence training? Yes, absolutely. Our residents use it very routinely. And it's really nice because the night before they do the surgery with me, they watch it, they come in, they're ready to go. They have seen it already two or three times. So especially if the surgeon is the same person who did the videos, it, you really get sort of a preview simulation through their videos. So I really encourage people to video, edit their videos record it, edit it, and keep it as an archive. And we would love to archive it on the Neurosurgical Atlas, create your collection. In fact, we're creating a collection for Dr. Ur Ture from Turkey, an excellent surgeon, as we all know, Dr. Bashkaya from uh, University of Wisconsin. They're going to have their own collections. So if you guys have ever, you know, have a big collection and you like to archive it, the residents can watch it the night before, Absolutely, yes, it will be of great value. The person who learns the most from your surgical video is in fact yourself. I can tell you that I've edited 15,000 hours of surgery and there has been no tool that have made me a better surgeon than watching my own surgeries and find out how in fact inefficient and poor surgeon I was at the beginning um, and how amazingly I improved as I watched my own videos. It's like a basketball game. It's a soccer game. If you watch yourself play and then criticize yourself, there's nobody better than you to be your own honest, critical advisor. Nobody's going to walk up to you in the operating room. No resident is going to tell you, well, you should have done better. There is no colleague who can come and tell you you can do better. So how do a faculty get better? I think that's a big question that we never talk about because the faculty have a lot to learn. I would argue that the faculty have a, more to learn than the residents because we are so much directly affecting patient care. So when we talk about resident education, 
I always say, let's first talk about faculty education, because if someone is engaged in education as a faculty, they will be much engaged in their resident education. It is very unusual to be a great educator when you're not interested in educating yourself. It all starts with yourself first. That is fantastic. Thank you for that insight. That, no that is really, really goes in touch my heart. Uh, and I was wondering also, how do you, how, what tool do you use to recall that? Right. I, um, the microscope is a very standard microscope, like a Pantera or a Kinevo. And then we use a mouth switch. The mouth switch is my most favorite. I call it the surgical pacifier because it keeps you quiet from talking and, uh, and whining. And so what happens is that I use the path and mouth switch. It really improves your capability of efficiency and also keeps you in focus. The image is right centered and it's a high quality image and it's enjoyable to watch. Fantastic. Thank you so much. No problem. Comment from Dr. Steenen and then Dr. Spiro after. Sorry, I, I don't have any comment. I, I think I forgot to lower my hand. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, me too, but uh, I just want to comment on what uh, and Dr. Uh, Gado said that uh, I've done many, many videos so when I was a resident and uh, actually this was the way that you learn from the masters. I mean, when you do the video of someone very experienced uh, with the operation, I mean, you, you, you actually, um, you are very careful to all the steps of the, the, the operation and you, you, you catch the, all the little tips and tricks that you cannot see or you cannot uh, visualize uh, in, the, in the OR. So it's, it's a great way to learn. We all learned a lot uh, from the neurosurgical class. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Dr. Aldia? You're on mute, doctor. Sorry, just a short comment on what Dr. Cohen said that uh, the importance of mental simulation of the surgeries is also, also important. We must use it in uh, conjunction with the practical skill simulation to obtain be the best results. Thank you. So thank you so much, everyone. There's been such amazing presentations. I've enjoyed this hour has gone just gone by really fast. And I've enjoyed the wisdom and vision of Dr. Cohen, Dr. Perrin, and the beautiful presentation from Dr. Steen and Stengel. Thank you all very much. We were very honored to have you with us and the wonderful round table. Um, thank you all. And we hope to see you in future soon. Hopefully thank you. Person. Thank you all. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for inviting. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining me. Wow.